um, at um, the School of Nursing Health Science Disability Studies um, at St Angela's College here in Sligo. And uh, Helen has had a long-standing interest in patient empowerment in chronic illness and the use of health and wellness coaching in supporting health behaviour change. And she's carried out a great deal of research in that area. Um, she leads up a programme, a postgraduate uh, diploma in applied health and wellness coaching at St Angela's College. And she completed her PhD in the area of using remote health uh, coaching to support lifestyle change for patients with diabetes too and followed on with the Cochrane research, uh, Cochrane systematic review and several other pieces of research which she's going to talk to you about one of those that she was the primary um, principal investigator of and so the title of her presentation today is telehealth in type 2 diabetes in the area of COVID-19. So I'll hand over to Helen, thank you. Thank you Idal for that lovely introduction and thank you to the committee for inviting me here today to talk about telehealth and type 2 diabetes. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a project that we did with the Donegal Diabetes Services where they were implementing telemonitoring with a particular uh, population, patients with type 2 diabetes, who had to start insulin treatment. And they were, it was a very um, new and novel approach in Ireland at the time, and little did we know what was coming down the line. And it left them in a position where they were very quickly able to move to the virtual environment and brought a lot of their colleagues along with them from the learning from the project. So I'm going to be talking about the learning from the project here today in the hope that other people who are having to look at the same thing will learn from it. Before you start uh, developing your telehealth intervention, it's important to look at the definitions. The definitions are problematic because this is a new service, and so there's lots of terms in the literature as a result, ranging from e-health to telehealth to telemedicine and so on. And this is a very good document for you to start with that gives you a lovely Venn diagram to show you which is which and what are the overlaps between them. And e-health is the broad term for any technology-enabled healthcare, and telehealth sits within that overarching umbrella term. So telehealth tends to be utilised in the patient's home, um, usually for the management of long-term conditions, or indeed for the time period post-discharge from hospital to help um, maintain patients in the home. And as we saw in COVID-19 in, in the literature, certainly, there's some examples of people being maintained in their home with COVID prior to admission to hospital and monitored in the home. So it involves the patient monitoring some aspect of their vital signs. Um, and there's lots of different devices that can be used, blood pressure monitoring, pulse oximetry monitoring, glucometer monitoring. And then th th that data is then transferred um, it can be transferred by a telephone line or via uh, Bluetooth to a medical server, to the healthcare professional, who then reviews the data and can intervene via technology, via, again, various means of technology. It can be automated responses via text message, automated responses via, via the web, or via telephone, or as we saw in COVID-19, via video consultation. Um, and what the healthcare practitioner is doing in that intervention is really, really important and interesting also. As we've heard from the previous speaker, it's not just a case of going automated and not focusing on, you know, what's the relationship then between the healthcare practitioner and the patient. And so the healthcare practitioner can engage in telecoaching or telecounselling with the patient based on the results that they're seeing. So telehealth is a kind of an all-encompassing term for that. So obviously as part of our project we reviewed the literature and we were very lucky to have a librarian on our team as well to help us find the literature. And there's lots of evidence out there for telehealth in, in diabetes in having an impact on HbA1c reduction. This is important that we look at this variable because for every 1% reduction in HbA1c you get, you get a corresponding 35% reduction in macrovascular endpoints, which is just a fancy way of, of saying changes that you see in patients that lead to heart attack and stroke, for example. And so it's of great interest uh, as a marker of how effective your intervention is. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through all these studies, but they're there in the report for anybody who wants to look at them, and the, it would be, need to be updated at this stage. But Marcolino is of interest, and I just want to say one point about that systematic review, because one thing they said was that the um, telehealth intervention, if it included some kind of medication titration, it was more likely to be effective on the outcome HbA1c. They also said, as we've heard in the previous speaker's talk, 
that older patients have more anxiety in engaging with technology than younger patients. That's not something we found in our study, but I'm, our study was in a very specific set of patients, so I'll talk about that when I come to it. This is the team. What I want to say about this is that the telemedicine project team consisted of, of managers and a project manager and also a patient. And that's really important to include a patient right from the get-go when you're starting to design your intervention. Include your patients. And um, the diabetes patients of Donegal were very well represented by John Quinn in the project team and the evaluation team. He contributed the whole way along and it was invaluable. His input was invaluable. So just remember, it's not just a case of presenting your results to your patients, include them the whole way through. Um, the other thing I'd say about that, uh, the diabetes nurse specialist Kathleen and Anne, were you know, the instigators of this research. They saw the gap in their practice and saw the need for it and little did they know how beneficial it would be during COVID-19. And the research team members, um, I was very lucky to work with the people I did work with on this, and it was very much a team approach. That's the report we generated for the HSC. I can't tell you everything that's in it today. I haven't got enough time. So it's there, and you can have a look at it if you want it. And that's the paper we published in Jimmer um, uh, with the results of the study also. So we were looking at the feasibility and effectiveness. So I'm just going to tell you one point about that. Efficacy studies are usually done in randomised controlled trials in specific sets of patients with, with strict inclusion-exclusion criteria. But it's very important then to take that intervention and implement it in a patient population in the real world, you know, of what happens in the real world with these patients. And so we did that with our colleagues in Donegal. They implemented the telehealth intervention. And we were very interested in looking at quantitative and qualitative outcomes. So it's not just a case of what effect did it have in the HbA1c, but what effect did it have on the healthcare team? What did they have to do? What were their experiences of inter implementing it? And what were the patients' experiences of implementing it also? Um, and also looking at things around process evaluation. How difficult is, is it to implement this? And you know, what, what um, effect does it have on workload? So the intervention itself, when the patients were deemed needing to go on to insulin, they were approached by the diabetes nurse specialist and asked to be included in, in, in this study. So they were consented. And a company called Fold Telecare were doing a project in Northern Ireland at the time on telemonitoring. So they were the company that were contracted by the HSC to provide the telemonitoring intervention. So a telecare support officer came and installed the box in the patient's home. Then the patient was set up to monitor at various time points as decided by the diabetes nurse specialists, usually twice a week for the first three weeks and then once a week for the, the, the subsequent nine weeks. So it, it lasted for 12 weeks. They sent their blood results. They were reviewed by the diabetes team. And then they were phoned with adjustments to make in the insulin and various other aspects of lifestyle advice. I'll tell you some of the examples of the things that were um, included in that. The, the, the technology has advanced you know, markedly since this, this box was invented. So um, I'll tell you a bit about that as well, what the patient said about the hub, as they called it. So we collected, as I said, quantitative data and qualitative data. So we obviously included biomedical variables, but also two psychosocial questionnaires. This is really important in this kind of research, that you don't just focus on the, the metabolic endpoints, that you also look at what might be the mediators of the changes in the patients. For example, how empowered did they feel to self-manage and what was their levels of distress and did this impact on that? Because those psychosocial indicators are the mediators of the biomedical change that you see. So as nurses, we're very interested in those measures, okay? We also took um, focus groups with the patients and with the nurses to see what their experiences of it was. And we designed an intervention log so that we could describe the intervention to you so that you can apply it to your own research um, or, or telehealth interventions. There were 39 patients, a mean age of 62, and more men than women in the sample. Remember, this is a purposeful sample. The diabetes nurse specialists identified them, the ones that are about to go on to insulin therapy. So it's not a random sample by any means. They were recruited from the GP surgeries across the region mainly, followed by from the diabetes clinics. I'm going to tell you about the qualitative data first because that's the one I find the most interesting and I don't want it to be last because I want to focus on it. So when we interviewed the patients in the focus group interview, they were such a great, I mean, they were just a fantastic group of people. They were just so eloquent and vocal about what their experience was. It usually started off with the psychological impact of diabetes, how distressing it is, 
how difficult it is to manage it, how angry it makes them all the things they have to do. So it kind of, they started off with why we needed this intervention in the first place. Very quickly we saw in the conversations that there were all the elements of patient empowerment going on in this telehealth intervention. So it's very much bound up in the relationship between the healthcare practitioner and the patient. Okay, So the technology is important, but the relationship is just as important. And in fact, it's fundamental. Um, and some of the things we saw were patients gaining control over their diabetes through the support from the fantastic diabetes nurse specialists, learning new information, gaining new skills to manage it, also the changed mindset, uh, you know, looking at things they never looked at before, like the sugar content of food, whereas before they wouldn't have bothered, they said, um, and an increased confidence to manage it. All of these are the components of empowerment. They talked about, and we had to call this team the nurse in the corner because that's what they said. They said it was like having a nurse in the corner of my house in this really difficult time where I had to start taking this drug. I'm really unsure of what I'm doing. Um, and I knew that somebody would be looking at my results very quickly and it made me feel safe and secure that somebody was doing so. They also reported that it resulted in reduced hospital and GP visits during the time that they were on the intervention. Um, in relation to using the technology, and this relates to the previous speaker's research as well, you know, the timing is really important when you train people to use the technology. In this case, full telecare were coming to train the patients probably the week before, maybe even longer. And then they, the following week, they had to start using the technology. By that time, like myself, they would have forgotten how to do it. And so that was very quickly remedied with some very clear written instructions. Also, for technology design, for people who are interested in that, it's really important that what you design is really user-friendly. There was a button on the box that had no use whatsoever in this study called the skip button. And most of the patients pressed it at one time or another. It shut the whole thing down and it caused such frustration for them. So design is really important. This is the CNS focus group. And they compared this to what previously went on. So patients would come to the clinic to be uh, advised and taught about how to start insulin. And they said it was like reams of paper of data that the patient had collected. And instead, in this intervention, they had access to the full data. So they knew exactly you know, wh what had been measured and when it had been measured. So it allowed them to make uh, better clinical decisions as a result, and that they had picked up more hypos than they would have in the previous um, care. They also mirrored the findings of the patient group. Uh, they reported increased patient knowledge and confidence, almost taking them by surprise at how willing patients were to take it on. And that's really important to look at your own philosophy of, you know, how willing or able are patients to take this on? We really need to change our thinking around this. They're far more capable than we think we are. Th th we think they are if they're given the right support. It's not a case of all technology and no relationship. It has to be both to support people to do it. And they also introduced uh, an insulin self-adjustment tool as part of the study, which was really interesting because there were some pre preconceived notions about who could manage this insulin adjustment tool. And they talked about this 78-year-old lady who came back a year later after the study and she had used it and she was still using it. And she said, oh, I had to adjust the insulin there a couple of months ago. I had to put it up by two and then I had to put it down by two, but I knew it wouldn't be a problem. And she was completely safe and competent and confident in doing so. So age is not a barrier. Um, but obviously the relationship between the diabetes nurse specialist and that lady allowed them to identify her as capable of doing this. There was a clinically significant uh, uh, effect on the HbA1c. That's the mean HbA1c over three time points at baseline, at the end of the intervention when it ended at 12 weeks and three months after that. The median is not much different. There's a difference of about 0.3 uh, in the median. So it, although the data is not completely evenly distributed, it's not that far away. So the median is about 9.3 for T1, 7.7 for T2, and 7.3 for T3. Um, so, and with no um, appreciable increase in weight, which is really interesting to see when somebody goes on insulin, one of the things that can happen is that their weight goes up. So something else was going on in the telephone calls that was preventing that as well. And the insulin dose obviously went up over the three time points. You might think, well, sure, that's what would happen when you start insulin. But if you look at the literature and, and the anecdotal information in clinical practice, the issue when somebody goes on insulin is that the insulin isn't titrated 
uh, quickly enough to a therapeutic level because of that not enough contact between the healthcare practitioner and the patient. So this intervention allowed the quick and timely elevation of the insulin dose to a therapeutic level to get that drop in HbA1c and reduce the risk of complications in the patient. So that's really important information. Um, the diabetes empowerment score, why did we measure this? Well, I insisted on measuring this because this is a mediator of behavioural change in your patients. So the more empowered your patient, the more confident they are to make the changes, to see the changes needed in the first place, and then to make them, the better their biomedical variables will be. So if you're designing a telehealth intervention, please measure some psychosocial uh, uh, measures as well to see what's happening in relation to that. And that is, without doubt, because of the relationship between the healthcare practitioner and the patients to allow that empowerment to happen. The other thing you should measure is something around distress. Um, for years, people thought that lots of people with diabetes suffer from depression. They do, but some of the patients aren't depressed. They're just distressed by what they have to do to manage diabetes, and we saw a drop in that as well. These are very closely linked to glycemic control, and that's been shown in numerous studies that empowerment and distress are linked to getting good glycemic control because it affects the patient's ability um, and confidence to engage in, in, in good care. This is the number of calls over the 12 weeks and after the intervention. You can see a drop after the 12 weeks. You might think that's a lot of calls. It is a lot of calls. And the nurses themselves said it probably could have been less. But remember, this was a pilot of the intervention. And so you're collecting data to see what would you change about the intervention afterwards. So it may be that less calls in some patients would have worked just as well or that you could actually do group calls with some patients, so lessening the workload on the healthcare practitioner. And that's obviously, you know, open to more research. The main issues that were talked about, obviously, poor glucose control was the main issue because they were going on insulin treatment, and obviously injection technique, hypoepisodes, and monitoring their blood glucose, and then problems uploading was an issue as well. And that's back to the technology and, and, and making sure it's user-friendly. It's highly acceptable to patients in this study. We measured that with the telemedicine satisfaction and usefulness questionnaire. Um, and I'm so glad we did because it showed across the board. And again, that's down to the relationship between the healthcare practitioners and the patients. Uh, and this is something that you think this is just a, a little study in the Northwest. I had a, um, a communication from a consultant in Harvard University there last week asking us for this data on our satisfaction and usefulness questionnaire because they're looking at the same thing in their telehealth interventions. So it's really important we look at that. It doesn't work for everybody, as Chris was saying. It, it's, not, it's not suitable for everybody, but it depends on the amount of support you're, you, you, it's feasible to give them when they're using it. Um, but there's been a number of rapid reviews since COVID looking at this, and they're showing that it's highly acceptable and patients are highly satisfied with telehealth interventions, with some exceptions. It doesn't suit everybody. And so we have to make sure it doesn't, as, as, as Chris was saying, increase the socioeconomic divide with our patients. Um, in relation to acceptability to the healthcare team, it's really important you, you look at this as well, because if it's not acceptable, it's not feasible, and if it increases the workload, it won't be adopted. It can't be. People are already uh, overworked as it is, so you can't be increasing their workload. It's supposed to enhance and underpin and attenuate what they're doing al or, uh, already, or uh, enhance and, and underpin what they're doing already, I mean. Um, but... If it creates large data sets that people have to look at all the time and review all the time, then it's not working. Uh, in the whole system demonstrator project in the UK, one GP called it a tsunami of data. So you can't have a tsunami of data for your healthcare practitioner. There has to be some other means of doing this. So technology people need to look at how do we do this. And in the States, in the Mayo Clinic, they're looking at uh, artificial intelligence in identifying which patients the healthcare practitioner needs to engage with. Uh, also, uh, the companies themselves that provide the monitoring, also some of them provide external track, trend and triage services to free up the healthcare practitioner to engage with the patients who are more complicated and more complex to get under control. Yeah, again, the technology issues were around training and ICT support during this particular study because it wasn't integrated with the technology they were using in their everyday service because it was a pilot. And so for future, the recommendation would be it has to be integrated with um, uh, current service. So in COVID-19, as I've said, this team rapidly transitioned onto telehealth in, during COVID-19. And 
In fact, in a, Attend Anywhere was adopted really quickly by the team and teams around them in the area because they knew that it was possible that age wasn't a barrier and that people feel supported in the virtual environment. And certainly, uh, dare I say it, the silver lining of this was that before this it was telephone support, now they had video consultations. So it's amazing what they can do now with patients with, with uh, diabetes. They can teach them to dial up a dose, they can show them injection technique, they can uh, talk to them about their self-monitoring technique and watch them. So um, video has enhanced that. And they're, they're continuing with that. And, and as I said, the technology has advanced. So it's all glucometers and apps now. And so the, the glucometer transfers the data to the app. And then the app either can be uploaded to a web-based pl platform in the case of the Libra scanner, but the other apps, the patient can download a PDF of the results and email it to the healthcare practitioner. Um, so, so there's lots of things possible at the moment and more planned um, with it. What we found is being substantiated by rapid reviews. The number of rapid reviews that have come out in COVID-19, it's amazing the research has been done, and they have totally validated our findings. Uh, in fact, they've, this, this rapid review by Chan uh, said that improvement in A1C was similar or superior to usual care, and I suspect that's because of the amount of contact you can have with your patient, for example, when they're you know, engaging in, in new insulin therapy. Um, but obviously, you have the healthcare providers are, in this rapid review said the same thing. The benefits are there, but there's issues of technical support. How do you manage the data? You can't have huge amounts of data coming into the healthcare practice. It has to be managed in some way. It has to be manageable. So what's the international opinion? Well, the Mayo Clinic have done huge research on telehealth in COVID-19. And this is what they're saying. They're saying telehealth actually improves access to uh, medical providers for patients who were underserved by uh, healthcare in the past. That it it's, uh, helps patients to access healthcare, you know, if they're living in more remote um, areas. That it's breaking down the borders, in their state borders in America. So for access across borders, it's, it's improving access. That the possibilities of artificial intelligence, as I said, um, and it's also blurring the boundaries between healthcare professionals in working together as teams and across teams. So, um, that, so, so, so what next? Well, I wouldn't be an educator if I didn't say where do we go from here. Um, and so on the HSE website, if anybody is looking for well, where do I go to, one place you would start really is the HSE guidance on remote patient monitoring. What are they saying about how to set this up? What apps are available already? And there are some apps available already. And also, very importantly, before you set it up, how do I evaluate it? Because if you don't evaluate it, then you're not likely to get the money to do it again. Um, also, just this week on Tuesday, or Wednesday, what day are we on? Friday, it's Tuesday. We had the launch of the uh, All-Ireland Digital Health Capabilities Framework for Nurses and Midwives. And this is based on an Australian framework. And while this was being launched, the whole time I was thinking, why is this just for nurses and midwives? <laughs> this should be multi-professional. And there at the very end, um, they said, we're working on a multi-professional capability framework. Why is that important? Because it will guide the development of the practice, it will guide the development of the standards of practice, and it will guide the development of evaluation and education for the practice. And so there's huge amounts of telehealth interventions coming down the line in our near future. Um, how do you prepare yourself for this? Well, there are lots of university level courses out there, but if uh, one of the ones I found, which I'm going to do myself, I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to do it, is this ERA 2021 Excellence in Remote Approaches uh, from Biogen, which they developed, I uh, think, in conjunction with the NHS, and it's available to professionals in the UK and Ireland. So looking at things around, how do I set my patients up on this? Uh, what's the safety issue? How do I deal with confidentiality or identify my patient? and so on. And they have one section on how do I engage with my patients in the, in the virtual clinic or in the remote consultation around using motivational interviewing, but it's not very detailed at all. And if you really want to learn how to use these techniques, then a shameless plug coming up here. I, you know, there's a fabulous course in St. Angela's College, a postgraduate diploma, or you can just do one year of it, in health and wellness coaching, which is about training and uh, ramping up the skills around empowering patients. First of all, what does that empowerment relationship look like? And then what techniques do I use to empower my patients? Um, and health and wellness coaching is part, already part of telehealth. So if you're interested in that, 
you can email me in relation to that or all the, all the information is available on the website. Lastly, I hope I got this message across uh, through my talk. Technology is here to stay. That's what the international consensus seems to be in some aspect, not, not for everything and, and not solely technology. A combination of face-to-face -face and technology seems to be the future. But it's really important to remember that it's not the tech, probably not the technology that's having the only impact. It's certainly activating patients in, and motivating them to monitor has some uh, uh, measure of activation or motivation on the patient. But the relationship formed between the healthcare practitioner and the patient is probably where the magic happens. And certainly it did in this project. So thank you very much for listening to me today. in terms of telehealth and the promises it holds in terms of pri providing independence in care, mm -hmm. really, for the p people to be empowered to take care of, the, to, to monitor their own care, mm -hmm. um, and, and all of the, the need to look at, though, how it's actually implemented, that it isn't, you know, it, it, it does, there's, it's quite complex in order to make it successful. Mm -hmm. So I'll just open the floor to any questions. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat box here, but I'll open the floor. Yes, um, we, we have Idel. Idel, would you like to? Thank you, Melinda, for a really fabulous talk. Thank you. Uh, and my interest is in sustainability of new interventions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to ask how many patients now do you do the attempt of your new starters are done in, in telehealth versus traditional methods? So has this translated into an ongoing method? It actually has. So I'll just I'll repeat it just because you can't. Uh, it's, uh, the question was in terms of sustainability mm -hmm. and how, ha how, has this, um, how has this gone on? Um, where are we now with, with mm -hmm. this, the sustainability of this particular yeah, piece I probably, of research? I probably didn't uh, spend enough time on that slide, um, Edel. So, I'll, yeah, I spoke to the um, clinical nurse specialist who's actually about to be an advanced nurse practitioner in this whole area, and she's... Um, involved in the implementation of Slauncha Care, obviously, and setting up her, her mode of practice in relation to uh, managing and monitoring patients with diabetes. So she says, the, at the moment, the way it is, is so they're met face-to-face -face in the clinic when the whole subject of having to start insulin uh, is, is broached and then followed up in the virtual clinic in, on Attend Anywhere. So that has sustained... And I should have said also that we followed up this group of patients the year after, 2019, and found that the HbA1c redu reduction was sustained the year after. In fact, it was lower. The mean HbA1c was lower. So it, uh, the effect is sustained, but also the telehealth intervention itself has been sustained. So patients are monitoring themselves, and they're using more and more apps to collect that data and then to send that data into the diabetes team. Now, unfortunately, not all of the apps are compatible with the, with the as you know, the technology. So some, some of the data has to be sent in via PDF, via email. And with the case of the Libra scanner, it's sent into a web-based platform that they can then review. So it's happening. There's more to come with the implementation so there's plans for more of this to happen with the management of diabetes because the nurses spend a lot of time on the road and so that time on the road might be better spent in the remote virtual clinics not for everybody for the certainly for the patients that it suits okay thank you and anna you have a question as well if you want to i was just going to ask about the cost effectiveness of the um, intervention because obviously you had to put boxes in and it's time given over. Did, was there an ask, did you look at that as part of the study? No, well, we, and that's a really, really good question because when we um, applied for the fund, or when you know, we had to put in the application and put the tender together and they, they awarded it to us, we said, you know, do you want a cost-benefit analysis as part of this because that would cost more money? So, no. But the data, I think, is there to do that. I'm looking at Rochelle over there. So, <laughs> the data is there. The data is there to do that because we collected all the data on the amount of telephone calls and the timing of the telephone calls and uh, or the length of the telephone calls per patient. Uh, so we can certainly calculate the nurse's time, but no, that has not been done. The HS, we, we made that available in the HSE report for the HSE to do that, but certainly that wasn't part of, or wasn't feasible within the funding we were given to, to do this study. In fact, they got a lot for, for they got their money's worth and more, um, and they said that themselves, but the cost-benefit analysis wasn't part of it. But it could, it, uh, it, some aspect of cost analysis could be done. 
Thank with the data we have. Fascinating study, and it's so good to see how it can work in some way. Thank you, thank you. Uh, um, Anna is just complimenting on the fascinating study that that was. And thank you, Helen. And in the interest of time, we'll move on. And thank you very much. Thank you.